<laughs> Welcome to the Kyle Experience. What we do here is try to take seemingly complex ideas and break them down into bite-sized, easily comprehensible pieces for the average Joe to understand. Uh, today, I have Naaman with me. This is my second episode of the Kyle Experience. Uh, anything you'd like to say or promote at this time, Naaman? I'm happy to be here. Thank you for asking me to be on this episode with you. As a self-proclaimed average Joe, I would say that beginning sentence was not easy for me to understand. So I hope we get through the rest of the episode with some, like you just chew that shit up and like yeah. bird feed it. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that's, that's the plan. Uh, my intro <laughs> needs to work. <laughs> my intro needs to work. <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and go on. So we'll just jump right into the poem and quote analysis. For those who have been watching for a while now, I normally do about like two or three quotes and two or three poems, but I'm changing it up to just a poem and a quote for the day to kind of keep times down. I know today my uh, topic's pretty long and kind of uh, a little complex. So I'm gonna try and make this a little quick just for everyone's time sake. So this poem is by Robert Longley. Uh, I guess it doesn't have a name, but above there, above there is reflection, color, colorful and bright, dancing in the sunlight, shimmering at night. Just below the surface, another world awaits, holding on to mysteries until some future date. Our view will let us marvel that these two coexist and think on our experiences and those we might have missed. The world is full of beauty and also some surprise, perhaps it is the future reflecting in our eyes. Uh, so you have any initial thoughts or comments on this poem? I was following all the way into the last bit and then that just like put this conspiracy. Um, There's a book we read in high school called Mr. Was, Mr. Was, Mr. Was. And it, in the start of the book, this young kid has like, he, he wrecks his bicycle on nothing. And he's like, there's nothing there. And at, by the end of the book, he realized that what he really wrecked on was his old self walking down the middle of the street. But his old self and his young self are incapable of comprehending each like they cannot see each other even though they both see the people around them yeah and that's the image that this just put in my head with the last line of with water of like it's it's if you're looking into water it's like your reflection but you can't actually touch it and so it's yeah. like coming up from beneath the water the future I feel you. And I had never personally read the book you were speaking about, but I think I get your, uh, I want to say it's an analogy here, where it's like, you could see, you could you could possibly see the future, but you might, you might not recognize that it's you, like that what you're looking at could be you in the future. If, if that's yeah. What you're at. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, that's even deeper. That's cool. That's interesting. So it's like, well, that's it. That shows the importance of liking what you surround yourself with, I guess, because it's a reflection of you, right? Yeah. Uh, Cutting into that note, I think self esteem plays a very large role in that because if you feel like you're not worthy of good things, then you'll probably surround yourself with bad things and people to uh, support that belief. So if you were to have like positive or good self-esteem, you wouldn't want to surround yourself with bad things. You'd only surround yourself with the best. Because you would know that that's what you deserve. I think everyone deserves True. that, by the way. True. Now, is there such is there such thing as like a common best, that's truth or... Or is it a subjective, like, I know you, we, there definitely are like collective unconscious things where it's like, everyone agrees, like pissing on the sidewalk is something that if you're doing it, you, that you don't want people to be looking at you doing it kind of thing. Yeah. But then there's other things like, well, some people decide to 
live this lifestyle. Some people decide to live this lifestyle. Like, is there a, is there a tr- single truth? And then truth is there good. Uh, so what I've come across, at least from like what I've been doing in my experience in my life, is that everyone's simply trying to do their best to do what they think is best. So, you know, your thought process can get thrown off where you can think that, you know, smoking crack or heroin is the best thing for you at that time, but you're still operating on that principle of doing what's best for you. It's sure. just that your, uh, your system for knowing what's good and bad is just thrown off at the time. But that's something so, that can be changed. Oh, that's, that was my question. Was like, so is it like... Um, you say it can be changed. Is it changed by like other conditioning or is it just like, well, things change. Some things change differently than others. Uh, so that's actually kind of what we get into today here on the show. I don't really want to give too much of a spoiler. So I'm just going to have to leave it and we'll get into that a little later. But uh, I think that, you know, obviously you can change the way you think. And yeah, I'll just to kind of keep from uh, doing any spoilers. I'm just going to go ahead and just leave it there. Got you. So I'm sorry I didn't like fully answer your question to the best of my ability, but... The episode should answer it, right? It should. I hope so. Uh, so any more uh, comments for this poem by Robert Longley? Not for me. Yeah, I thought this was a decent one. Uh, I thought that... I think the most interesting part of this poem for me is the second uh, stanza, the first line, or just uh, first two lines, just below the surface, another world awaits. So uh, if you're thinking about reflection, uh, below the surface, there's another world that exists, or at least that's what he's telling us. But that's something that we'll never be able to experience because we'll always be on our side of the reflection. So um, to me, something like that is something that's like kind of not even worth saying because it's something that we'll never be able to achieve. But then you kind of think of like science where it's like, well, science doesn't know all these things, but it still like brings them up for the uh, hope that maybe one day someone else will be able to figure it out. So maybe that's what this guy's aiming for here is that he knows that something's there, but he also knows that he can't reach it. That's deep. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to get that deep into it. I was just thinking, just because when I think of like another world, it kind of brings me back to, uh, I had to write this paper for my, uh, I want to say it was modern philosophy class. And what it was about was uh, Nietzsche's view on nihilism and like life affirming beliefs. So there's like, just kind of for an easy explanation, there's life affirming beliefs, which uh, affirm the life that we're living right now. And then there's life negating beliefs, which uh, negate the life we're living now in return for a life that we will live after the life that we're living now. So one good example of this would be like hell or heaven, where, where you would think that you want to do everything in this current life to uh, make your next life better. And while you're doing that, you're also negating the fact or the value of the life you're living now. So that's why it's considered life negating. Uh, I had never thought of that before. I understand. I think I understand what you're saying, though. And so that like the opposite of that, also saying nihilism is like, well, this life doesn't matter. So perhaps do bad things. Yeah. And, uh, just for the people at home, the definition of nihilism is the view that the highest beliefs in society have become unstable and not really worthy of the praise that we give them. So that's exactly what you were saying. Like, well, there's no reason why we shouldn't do anything bad because this life sucks anyway. So it's not like it can get any worse. But uh, what Nietzsche thinks and what he kind of gets into, uh, I guess I'll have to do a uh, video on him. But he thinks that the ubermensch can come through or the superman or overman 
will come through and he'll have the best possible qualities to be able to handle any situation in life. So then something like nihilism would never even occur to him because he would create his own beliefs. So then his beliefs would be based on what he thinks, not what anyone else does. What is that called? Uh, the Ubermensch or uh, Overman. Overman. Is yeah. that a individual or is that a type of person? Like an I believe it's a type. Type. Is it a generational type? Like, like eventually man will evolve to become this form of being? Or is it an individual, like, say, like, monks believe life is an individual spiritual journey? So is um, it an individual thing you have to reach, or is it a species thing? I think it's a species thing, and I believe that because uh, I think I read somewhere something about we're laying the groundwork for the Ubermensch, like, as we speak. Like, all the things that we do wrong now are something that he would learn from in the future, so uh, pretty much all of life would be just like a big book to him that he could learn from and take only the good, or at least that's what the Ubermensch would do, would be okay, yeah. take only the good and none of the bad. Uh, so this is neat. This is still attached to Nietzsche. Nietzsche? Yeah. I think it's Carl Jung. Like the, he, that, those words make me think of Carl Jung's hero's journey, like, which is also archetypes of like, well, what... If you, true, if you want to experience life the best way, how do you do it? Well, you have to set out. You have to have a mission in mind. You have to be unyielding. Like, you have to believe that that is the best thing. Like, you have to be your own hero. So, but are all people heroes, though? Because I think, like, if you look at, like, capitalists, socialists, communists, all, like, all the different forms of literal, like, political society, um, even going back to, I've been reading the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so, like early early civilizations the caste systems are like well farmers farm they don't do anything but farm why because if farmers didn't farm then kings couldn't eat bread and if kings couldn't eat bread then they couldn't hunt boar and if they couldn't hunt boar then they couldn't be fat and if they weren't fat they couldn't wage war so stay in your lane in other words <laughs> yeah i think um i want to say that there's definitely uh, a kind of caste system. Like, obviously, the Uberman should be at the top, the Oberman. And then I want to say everything beneath him would be like the crowd. Or uh, do you know what the mm -hmm. crowd is at all? Well, for the people at home, I guess I'll give an explanation. So the crowd is basically like public opinion. And uh, mm -hmm. they say it's the crowd because it can be easily changed by like a uh, herder or something like that. So like the herder could be like the media preparing, uh, portraying a situation in a light that makes one side look worse than the other. And the crowd would go with whatever the herder says to do, even if the way that it's being portrayed is false. And that's, that. yeah, sorry. I was just let, like following along, like your words are making sense. Okay, yeah. That's uh that's pretty much all I got. I don't know, uh I didn't really study the Ubermensch too much. My focus on Nietzsche was the uh nihilistic side of things. Mm -hmm. Uh that was mostly because when I was in college, I felt that the uh, the values that I had been taught like growing up had seemed to be failing me while I was in college. So the highest values I was in that form of nihilism where why would I do this? if I'm gonna get the same result regardless like why would I do the right thing if I'm still gonna get xyz or whatever you know but uh to kind of close here and like end to move on the reason I felt or the thing that I learned was so what we do with science is we try to get as far away from religion as we possibly can by negating that world but Science does the same exact thing that religion does by negating certain parts of the real world by saying that it's that one thing is this and it's not anything else. So it's uh, in its own way, science is its own belief system. And pretty much what I had to learn, like through going through the nihilism of Nietzsche and stuff like that, that you have to create your own beliefs. And the only way to do that is to believe something that's worthy of your belief. Uh, well, I thought, or they say that science is the most normal attempt at that, because what more, what's more believable than the truth? You know what I mean? 
Like there couldn't be nothing that's more believable than science because science tries to get to the most objective form of the truth. So in that way, science is sort of a religion. So even science can't be trusted 100% if you're trying to get away from religious values. So then you have to kind of create things yourself. And that's where I'm at right now is just trying to kind of navigate my way through the uh, kind of the morality problems of life without using a uh, religious background as support because in the end of the day, like some of the things that religion preaches isn't right. And well, I'm not gonna follow something that I know is wrong. That's deep. Yeah, I, uh, I guess I kind of went on a tangent there on the nihil uh, nihilism stuff. <laughs> but we gotta get good in. stuff it's good stuff <laughs> yeah uh so uh do you have anything else for robert longley no that was a good discussion i appreciated the things that you had to discuss oh yeah i appreciated your input too man uh well so we'll move on to this quote by ayanla ayanla von zent I on the uh, and it's, I guess there is no title, but the quote goes, the journey into self-love and self-acceptance must begin with self-examination until you take the journey of self reflect geez, until you take the journey of self-reflection, it is almost impossible to grow or learn in life. Uh, so do you think that that's true? Do you think that without self-reflection, it's impossible to grow? Yeah, there's, I, I can't, I don't know. This is where I, we need someone to be able to Google things. Um, yeah. I don't know who was that made the quote, but it goes something along the lines of there's nothing more, like nothing worse than an unexamined life or nothing more regretful than an unexamined life, something along those lines. And I'd say I, I do agree with that because thinking that like if you don't understand yourself like if you don't understand your limits you, like you don't know what game you're playing and the limits is a pretty relative word could, and it could be used in a lot of contexts as out of context like saying saying well a specific person can't dunk a basketball and then they become Steph Curry it's like okay well he didn't need to he's still a professional basketball player yeah. Um, it, but so it's like not limits in that sense, but limits like, well, that person is clearly an athlete, whereas there are people that since it doesn't matter how hard they train, they are not that <laughs> they're not that guy, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, but that guy could also, if he truly found what he like his right, his true right, he reflected like it goes with what you were talking about, the Ubermensch, like that, that whole journey of trying to be the best version of you you have to know what you are yeah um one thing i was getting when you were talking uh this thing it's called like i can't think of what it's called but you don't know where you're going until you know where you're at and i think that could be possibly like the self-reflection where it's like if you're aiming for a goal you need to find out first where you are in relation to that goal in order to make a plan to reach that goal so uh, for self-reflection, if you don't self-reflect, then you won't know where you're at. So then it's going to be damn near impossible to find out if you're going the right direction to reach that goal. Because you could be going west when the goal is east. But since you didn't like self-reflect and like get a compass to find out where you're at, you went the wrong way thinking you were going the right way. Mm -hmm. Oh. That happens a lot. Um, so my question is, in that self-reflection, is it looking at a tool or is it once you do look at a tool and you realize that you've been going east or you look up and you realize that, like, as sooner or later, depending on how far you go, you'll just realize it. Um, like, this is not at all where I thought I was going to be. Should you then... Like is in your self reflection. I guess it's probably um, up, like case by case, but having to decide 
that's what it is. You have to decide to either continue to go east. Like, it's like, well, okay, well, where am I going? Or go west. And that could be a lot of different things. Like, it could be a heroin addiction. It could be, like, I, know, I tend to believe that there are th things occur, are always occurring in the world, and your ability to interact with them is based off of your daily habits. So, for me, I always train. And sometimes people ask me, like, what do you train for? I'm like, well, I can't, I don't have a good, I don't have a specific answer. Well, I like next weekend I have a race or May 3rd, I have a basketball tournament. Like don't, don't can't reply that way, but knowing yeah. that I have my own beliefs of where my life is going to go. And it's just my job to prepare for. It. I think that's speaking of religion, um, the Christian text, the Holy Bible, um, use the parable of like farmers praying for rain um to they prayed for like weeks and weeks and weeks but only one farmer went out and prepared his field and the other was just sitting around praying all the time well then when the rain came the farmer who prayed and was preparing even though they were both just hoping the rain came and he was ready the one who hadn't prepared was not ready for the blessing when it came to him so in that sense, full circle moral of the story, it's what do you like, do you believe, do you believe in something? Do you believe that there is such thing as karma? Do you believe that there are things occurring that you can't control and that those things are benevolent, you know? Yeah. And I think like with the thought of belief, it's not only believing, but also acting on those beliefs as well. So True. like you can say that you believe that you want to be the best or whatever, but if you never act on it, then do you really believe it? Or so I guess I think action kind of goes into here too, where it's like, if you don't have that action and you only believe in like pray, like you were saying with the Bible example, mm -hmm. then you won't, when that situation comes, you won't be ready for it. Like you were saying. Yeah. That's those are really tough thoughts. This kind of reminds me of, one of my uh, rapper friends, he uh, said that, you know, if I give up rapping right now and tomorrow, there's no chance that I could have, like, I've, I've been practicing, like, I've been working, doing all this stuff for it. And I've been practicing for this moment that I might not see right now, but I have faith that it'll be there in the future. But if I, I believe that it'll be there in the future, regardless of if I work or not, but if I don't work, then I won't be ready for it when it happens. And that's what, um, that's at least what I was getting from my friend or what I learned from my friend who has been rapping now is that like, if you don't prepare for those situations and that's something I guess I've been, I guess I've learned it already just through like basketball and like doing sports where you, you constantly practice, you practice even when you don't have a game, you practice even when you got practice the next day, like you're constantly practicing, getting better, trying to get better at something for an opportunity you might not be able to see right now. But if you didn't do that practice, then you're not going to be like prepared for that um, event. And mm -hmm. one quote I actually saw from, uh, I wish I could remember who it was, but it's like, if you don't prepare or if you don't practice and you're preparing for failure, pretty much. What about like, so free will then it's like, do, do you, are there innate actions that a Kyle LeBlanc that a name and unfleet like are there a like actions that those two entities would do on their own regardless of the circumstances or is it dependent on one's oneself's beliefs and actually like where does the free will come in um uh, i'm not 100 sure on there but when you were saying that it kind of made me think of like just how different people like view themselves and like their existence in the world so like mm -hmm. i wish i knew what religion it was but there's a religion in like asia where they kind of view their not just they view themselves as not just their body but their environment as well and i think what i was talking to in relation to that was like you were saying outside of the context of whatever we're in but uh that's kind of like a problem we have in like science 
with testing is once you take someone out of their natural environment, then they're no longer naturally acting. So uh, then you're not really getting, you're kind of getting skewed results because you're doing it in an environment setting instead of a natural one, even though you're still doing like something that would obviously be outside of the normal because you're uh, measuring their whatever variable you're trying to measure at the time. But once you take them out of their natural environment, then that's not really them anymore, so to speak. If that makes sense. It absolutely does. It absolutely makes sense. Right. Now, perfect. Cool example I have right now, my Rottweiler puppy. She's a year old now. I have three different walking restraining devices that I use. We'll just call them restraining devices, period. I have a choke chain. I have a regular collar restraint um, that we call her pretty collar. And then she has a body harness. And I use those three harnesses in different contexts every single time. Um, she knows that one of them is just, okay, we need to go on a walk to go potty or something like that. The other is, hey, we're going to more of a like social content, like you're going to be around people. I need you to behave this type of way. And then the third is for training purposes. And so I could use that in any context. It's meant for maximum control. And she, over time, is like Pavlov's dog, like she starts to associate those things with each other. Yeah. And starts behaving in a specific way in her own context. Like, yeah, you know, that those are really good. I like the way you wrap that up to like, if you, as soon as you take it out of that context, like, like a street fight, like, oh, you can train in a gym all day. But what, like, what happens yeah. if the other, per what if the other person doesn't agree to do karate and you're out there trying to do karate? It's like, well, I'm going to throw a brick at you. <laughs> yeah, so, well, then you're kind of screwed so that, that would mess up uh, at least uh that would mess up what you normally do your routine or whatever right yeah, yeah humans love their routine they feel safe in routine and that kind of gets into what we're going to be talking about today so uh, if you don't have any more comments i'm gonna go ahead and transition over all right so our topic today is cognitive experiential self theory uh let's go ahead and jump right in uh, cognitive experiential self theory is the view that individuals have two fundamentally different but parallel modes of information processing. A rational system where individual where the individual operates primarily at the conscious level, and an experiential system that is more automatic and intimately associated with effect or feelings. Uh, so rational, analytical, intentional, and effortful system uses logic and evidence, and experiential. Uh, gut level, emotionally based system, processes information rapidly and effortlessly, it's associative or associates with things in the past, and relies on heuristics or mental shortcuts for uh, cognition. Uh, situational demands and individual differences affect which system predominates. So uh, pretty much like whatever you're doing at that time will kind of de determine what system you're operating through. Uh, it was developed by Seymour Epstein in 1994. So this is a relatively recent uh, personality theory. Uh, do you have any questions on this slide? Uh, is there is there more information? Yeah, like, a little bit more about this slide. Yeah, got you. Then I'm ready to move on. Okay. So self theory. Uh, Epstein's cognitive experiential self theory is unique from other theories in that it places a dual process model within the context of a global theory of personality, rather than considering it as an isolated construct or a cognitive shortcut. Uh, so pretty much what they're trying to say here is that uh, his theory is unique in that it places the uh, dual processing or rational and experiential as the main, like it's something that is something you can't escape. Like everything you do is experience dual, dually through this theory. Uh, Epstein argues that within the context of day-to-day -day life, a constant interaction occurs between the two systems. Because the experiential is immediate and guided by emotions and requires little in terms of cognitive resources, it is especially equipped to handle the majority of information processing 
on a daily basis, all of which occurs outside of our conscious awareness. Uh, this allows us to focus the, liminal, the limited capacity of our rational or conscious system on whatever our conscious attention needs at that time. The uh, individual differences in preference for analytical and experiential processing can be measured using the Rational Experiential Inventory, or the REI for short. The REI measures two independent processing modes with two factors, uh, measures the two independent processing modes with two factors, and the factors are need for cognition, which is the rational factor, and faith and intuition, which is the experiential factor. This should take us into the rational system. So the rational system is analytic, intentional, logical, it mediates behavior by conscious appraisal. It's slow for delayed action and easily changed through reason. It's also conscious. The analytical rational system is that of conscious thought. It is slow, logical, and a much more recent, oh my goodness, evolutionary development. Uh, the rational system is what allows us to engage in many behaviors that we consider to be uniquely human, such as uh, like abstract thinking or uh, I guess the use of language. Uh, it is an inferential system that operates through reason and demands large amounts of cognitive resources. And as a result of the uh, large amount of cognitive resources it uses, it has a very limited capacity compared to the expert experiential system. Uh, the rational system is unique because of its awareness and capacity for conscious control. Unlike the experiential system, which is unaware and independent of the rational system, the rational system is capable of understanding and correcting for the operation of the experiential system. So pretty much what they're getting at here is that your rational system can on occasion override your experiential system or your uh, instincts. So then we'll move into the experiential system. It's a uh, holistic, automatic, emotional, it mediates behavior by feelings and it's fast for immediate change, although, although it is also resistant to change and it's also pre-conscious. Uh, does that make sense to you at all? I know the two changes are a little kind of contradictory. That should, those things are just describing the experiential system? Yeah. Got it. All right. So the in, intuitive or experiential system is, or how I like to do it, or how I like to think of it is how you feel. It's a fast, automatic, holistic, and intimately associated with effects or our emotions. Uh, change occurs within the system through three forms of associative learning, classical conditioning, or operant conditioning, and observational learning. This is a pre-conscious, unconscious learning system that humans likely share with other higher order animals as it is a much older evolutionary development. So that's kind of uh, what we were talking about with your dog, like you're training your dog for whatever you're trying to get it ready for. Uh, the things that we would experience would be kind of similar to what your dog would experience or the experiential system is pretty similar to the system your dog's constantly running on. It has been shown that emotional involvement in experience affects the relative influence of the experiential system, or uh, as emotionality goes up, so too does the importance and influence of the experiential system. So this kind of goes into what you were talking about with your dog, where you can put him in a situation in that uh, harness and he'll expect a certain behavior. So uh, learning often occurs slowly in this system uh, through reinforcement and repetition, but once a change has occurred, it is often highly stable and resistant to invalidation or kind of reverting back to old behaviors. Emotional reinforcement is necessary for associative learning to occur, though. So you have to be emotionally invested in learning something to make it uh, part of your experiential system. Uh, one thing I thought that was kind of cool about this system was that your emotions or how you feel also affect what behaviors or activities you decide to engage in. So um, sure. a good example of that would be like, if you're feeling sick, you're not going to want to go run a mile. Sure. Uh, and this is based on reinforcement history of the experiential system, 
So what you've experienced in your past, as well as your own personal motivations to approach or avoid certain situations. So uh, basically, this is uh, doing what you think is best, or yeah, pretty much, or what your instincts feel is best. And that's uh, this is contrasted with the rational system of doing what we logically know it to be best. That uh, that makes sense. I'm sitting here thinking, just kind of rolling around in my mind. Yeah, I, that makes sense. Like I said, it's probably how I am. Like I act based off of my experiences, which give me feelings, which give me thoughts, and that's why I stay away from certain things and gravitate towards other things. Yep, exactly. And uh, I think it's important to uh, know again for the experiential system how it's automatic. So this one uh, predominates your first impression, regardless of uh, what system you would like to. Like there's no, there's no uh, room for error here. Like the experiential system always is first. Sure. Uh, dang, I wonder if I, okay, here it is. All right, so recent research has identified three reliable faucets of intuitive experiential processing, intuition, imagination, and emotionality. Uh, I put the definition of intuition here, just in case somebody at home doesn't have a very clear uh, definition, because without a clear definition, this doesn't really make very much sense. Uh, so intuition is the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. So pretty much intuition is the experience of the experiential system because it's on, it's automatic. You don't have a chance to, uh, to think about it. Uh, but intuition is most closely associated with the system as a whole, as this faucet addresses the experiential system's capability of making associations and effective judgments outside of our conscious awareness. Uh, and that's for the first of the three faucets. The second one, uh, within the intuitive experiential system, imagining an experience can have cognitive and behavioral effects similar to the experience itself. In this way, imagination also plays a primary role in the experiential system, which learns primarily through experience. So what they're saying here is when you imagine something, you kind of experience it in your own way. Uh, so uh, you learn, your experiential system learns through experience. So when you imagine something, you're experiencing it. So you're learning and reinforcing that uh, behavior or thought in your mind. Uh, and then third is emotion. And emotion is the third faucet of the intuitive experiential system. It may be that emotion is the most fundamental component for without it, the experiential system would not exist at all. In my notes, I would say, I said, uh, without emotions, we would be like a rock and would feel not even the need to move. Uh, so uh, what I was getting at here with my kind of thought was that the whole reason we have the experiential system is for like your instincts and like automatic thinking so that you don't like fight or flight kind of response. But if you don't have emotions, then there's no reason for you to even move because you wouldn't feel frightened you wouldn't feel like aggravated, you wouldn't feel anything. You would be like a rock. So uh, my question is, do you think that plants would be a good example of like the end uh, experiential system? Because plants move and they like feel their way towards sunlight and like they'll move towards sunlight. So that kind of makes me feel like they have their own experiential system. But at the same time, it kind of seems like you know, at least in our uh, scientific world, the way that we were taught it, you know, there's plants and then there's animals and they're separate. I hear that. At the same time though, I've heard people say that, like swear that if you play a plant specific music or say certain words to it, that that will help it grow like versus hurt it grow. Yeah, but I was just thinking in relation to the uh, 
emotion being the most uh, fundamental component, because without that emotion, why would a plant want to feel like, why would a plant want to move towards sunlight unless it knows that it needs it and needing something's an emotion in its own kind of way. So then it's like, well, are plants really not as alive as we think, or are we just kind of like messing up? Are we missing the, are we missing the ball here? Are, are we classifying plants as something that we shouldn't be classifying them as? Good point. Very good point. Uh, but if you don't have anything else for the uh, experiential system, that's all I have for it. Yeah, I'm good with moving on. All right, we'll move on. So then this is the uh, whole graph of the uh, comparison between the experiential and rational system. Have that there. So this is the uh, graph that I kind of want to, how I say, go through a little bit. And it kind of just explains like how the experiential and rational system work in a certain way. So these uh the dashed lines mean that it's unconscious, and then a solid line means that it's conscious. So the rational system is 100% conscious, but the experiential system is, I mean, uh, these are obviously just kind of guesses here. I want to say it's 50-50, like 50% unconscious and 50 unconscious, but you know, uh, we see all these things in popular uh, psych where it's like, oh, our unconscious is actually like an iceberg. You're only seeing just the tip. So if our conscious is like that, then it would only be like 1090. You know what I mean? But I think this is a good uh, drawing to kind of illustrate just how your brain kind of works. So in the middle here, you have creativity and intuitive wisdom. Uh, and that's where the consciousness from the rational system and the consciousness from the experiential system kind of meet. But uh, the line of awareness here is an important thing because, as you'll notice, the rational system never goes beneath this line, while the experiential system always has to be underneath this line, at least a little bit. Because uh, the experiential system is like automatic, so we're not in control of it. And then in these boxes, I have uh, more definitions of how you can view the rational and experiential systems. Uh, is this graph making sense to you? I'm trying, I'm breaking it apart right now. Um, your description of it makes sense. I'm just trying to like understand beyond the description. Like, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? Not just what does it mean to the graph? Yeah. Hmm. So uh, when I think of this, uh, it kind of brings me back to the measures of need for cognition for the rational system and then trust and intuition for the experiential system. And it kind of makes it uh, a little easier to understand because if your experiential system leaning, then you would have to trust your intuition because over half of this is underneath your line of awareness or your conscious awareness. So you have no idea really what's going on. You're just believing that you'll do the right thing where for the rational system, the need for cognition, you would wanna be as conscious for that as possible. That way you're, cogn you're uh, getting all the information you possibly could. That way you can make the most rational and logical decision based on the information uh, provided. That makes sense. I've, um, and that's your description, that is you describing, like that's what this graph is saying. Uh, that's what I was taking from it. And then that's it. Uh, for the creativity and wisdom, like where your systems meet is where the uh, I feel the most happens. You know what I mean? Like, uh, for example, I kind of get into this a little bit later in the presentation where you can uh, use your experiential system to move from the rational into uh, the unknown. And that would be a conscious decision because uh, whoops, that's something you would have to do yourself. Because if you're being logical, there's no reason to move to the unknown. You only want to stay with what you know. I hear that. Um.
Yeah, that may, I mean, it makes sense. So is it like, is it an obligation to step into the unknown? Like what exactly is the unknown? Um, so I get into uh, that a little bit more in two slides. If you want to just move on and try to get to that a little sooner. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, so this slide gets into the individual differences. Let me go and pull my notes up again. All right, so individual differences within the contest context of CEST can be assessed in a couple of different ways. First, if rational and experiential processes are independent systems for processing information, then one would suspect that each person would have an intelligence level for each of the two systems. So basically what they're saying here is if we're right and the experiential system and the rational system are not the same and they're separate, then you should be, you should be able to tell how smart you are with your rational side and how smart you are with your experiential, experiential side. Uh, they continue on to say that rational intelligence can be measured easily enough with simple IQ tests, which naturally assess many aspects of the rational system. However, IQ tests do not assess many of the primary aspects of the experiential system. So to address this issue, the CTI or constructive thinking inventory was developed to measure individual differences in efficacy of the experiential system. Studies have shown no correlation between IQ measures and CTI scores, which means that uh, if you have a good, like a high IQ, then it doesn't mean that you're necessarily gonna have a high CTI or experiential score. Uh, individual differences in preference for one system over the other is another meaningful personality variable that can be assumed. The REI and the REIM were developed to test that assumption. Damn it. Uh, all right, and then to kind of go onto the slide, because uh, all that stuff was pretty much like intro stuff to the uh, individual differences, but the real meat is on the slide. So a preference for rational thought shows a number of beneficial associations an increased academic achievement, GRE scores and grade point average, self-esteem, openness to experience and conscientiousness and decreased levels of depression and state trait anxiety have all been associated with a need for cognition or our higher levels of rationality or use of your rational side uh, will lead to all those things I just listed, uh, according to the study. Higher levels of faith and intuition have more mixed results. So a higher level of faith of intuition, faith in intuition can lead to creativity, spontaneity, emotional expression, agreeableness, extroversion, and uh, positive interpersonal relationships. Uh, they are associated with experiential processing. However, it has been linked with authoritarianism, superstitious belief, and stereotypical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, on the next slide, and that's kind of what we were talking about on the last slide, I kind of get into a response to the negativity that I seem to, uh, that I felt that people were giving to the uh, experiential side of things, because I feel like without the experiential side, then the rational side would be stuck, like in pretty much limbo because they can't do anything. They'll just be stuck trying to figure out what the most rational thing would be to do. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting point I thought was that research has consistently found that women tend to rely more on the experiential processing where men seem to be more prone to the rational side. Research also suggests that our preference Pref uh, preference processing style likely changes with age. Specifically, as age increases, preference for faith and intuition decreases. However, no relationship between age and need for cognition has been found. Uh, I also have something for that. So in the study that they use for this, uh, all this information for most of the slides in this presentation, the study is called Age and Gender Differences and Preferences 
for Rational and Experiential Thinking. And the authors are Ruth Sledek, Malcolm J. Bond, and Patty A. Phillips. Uh, in their abstract, they suggest that a convergence of the rational and experiential systems happens in adulthood, although the timing for this uh, conjoining may be different for men and women. However, in later adulthood, it seems that the relationship appears to diverge again or become separate, which would explain why uh, like people who get older get like dementia or like other brain kind of disabilities because their, uh, their sides aren't connecting or communicating the way that they should be. Mm -hmm. uh, but did you think any of that was kind of surprising for you for the individual differences? Like, did you expect there to be a little bit more negativity for rationalism or was this like kind of on point with what you were expecting? The slide before this, um, oh, this was the slide before? Yeah. Um, so I guess it was the same slide then. You were talking about the traits that like intuition and stuff uh, or faith and belief yeah. start to uh, like benefit, I guess. And that just that whole thinking, um, it was also pr pretty surprising to me. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's short. Like it was cool hearing like what like what like other than just saying like like people. A lot of people say they have faith. A lot of people say they have intuition. A lot of people say they're spiritual or whatnot. But what do those behavior like? What kind of behaviors to do those? statements prompt um i guess i had never thought of it that deeply so it was surprising but at the same time i'm I, it's like yeah I, I can see that yeah uh i think pop's just uh pop culture has kind of conditioned us to this a little bit with like the difference between right brain and left brain uh thinking like mm -hmm. that's what i this whole like time i was doing this presentation and studying for it and everything I just kept coming back to that, like the right brain versus the left brain, because I mean, it's pretty much what this is, is like uh, a different way of putting it. Or left brain and right brain is a different way of putting the uh, cognitive experiential self theory. It's, I'd say that's a really good way of connecting the two. Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, this is a response of Quora, and uh, I pulled this up because I think it kind of gives a pretty good explanation of why we need both sides of our brain. So I'll just go ahead and jump right in. This is by Kay Grace Lilly. Uh, so, well, rationality is essentially logic, and logic operates from the premise of known information. Creativity explores unknown territory. And just as I wrote that, all I could think of was Spock and Kirk from Star Trek, Polar Opposites. One toes the line of logic, the other operates way outside the box, delving well into the unknown outcome. Here's how it works, really. Rationality takes all the information one knows and applies it. Creativity takes some of what one knows by experience and keeps opening doors to see what if. In science, there definitely can be powerful explorations into creativity by utilizing that what if. But if you won't see it you but you won't see that used in accounting. You'll find it in architecture and it has been tested with fundamental laws applied. Skyscrapers and bridges are good examples of the uh, creativity that it would take or the creativity, uh, the use of your knowledge in creativity or using rational knowledge to be creative. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, rationality does not completely kill creativity, but it does damper it by limiting the scope of information available to what is already known. So it naturally looks backwards and it looks to available resources for information. Creativity, by its very nature, is turning on lights where there were none, so it's always looking forward. Also know this, that there does have to be a foundation for creativity. There has to be some knowledge that can be applied 
but it takes that information as a starting point. Specifically to your questions, rationality limits uh, visibility because you can only see what you have already learned and cannot apply new thinking. So that's uh, kind of, I want to at least have that in here because I felt that this presentation has been, uh, at least I feel it's been a little negative towards the experiential side and kind of negative towards creative people saying that they're unrational or whatever. But I think that it's worth stating that like that ra that irrationality that people want to say that uh, experiential leaning people experience could also be seen as a, a way of being creative. And like using the their rational information in a creative way to answer a question or deal with whatever they're doing with at that point in time. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Okay, does I'm it make sense? Listening along. Oh, sorry, what were you saying? So I'm just listening along. Um, okay, it, it uh, makes sense. Does it make sense why I included this in here? No. No. Okay. Uh, so kind of as as an explanation for everyone else, I like this. Uh, I guess quote from K. Grace Lilly as a response to the uh, negativity I felt. I mean, I don't think I'm the most creative person on earth, but I definitely can say that I'm a little creative. Uh, but the negativity I felt in the levels of faith and intuition, because uh, the uh, rational side had nothing negative linked to it, which I felt was kind of unfair. But, all right. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah. Are you still good? Yeah, I just had to stand up. I'm just listening to you. Okay. All right. So uh, to kind of close here, and this is one of the final slides, we'll get into the interaction or how these two systems interact. So the basic uh, way that the uh, system operates or your brain operates is there's an event. And the, uh, from that event, the experiential system makes automatic associative connections to other events or experiences within the same schema. I felt that it was necessary to provide a definition of schema for people at home who may not know what that is. So a schema is a mental structure of preconceived ideas, a framework representing some aspect of the world or a system of organizing and perceiving new information. So pretty much like, you know how you can play baseball with like a stick and a rock? Right. That's what a schema is. Like you're playing, you're essentially playing baseball. You're just not using all the same things. So mm -hmm. uh, to kind of bring this into like a real world example, let's say you, I mean, I guess I'll just use a negative example because that's usually the easiest way to do these things. But let's say you grew up and you watched your mom get beat or something. If you saw somebody uh, beating or you would like know the signs of like how somebody who gets beat acts. So if you were to see that somewhere else, you'd be able to link the behavior of the person who got beat to like your experience of seeing that happen. So you'd be able to link those two things, whereas somebody who wasn't working within that schema wouldn't see those two things as connected. Um, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, whoops. Uh, schema also influences attention and the absorption of new uh, knowledge. People are more likely to notice things that fit into their schema while reinterpreting contradictions to the schema as exceptions or distorting them to fit. Uh, so that's just the definition of schema. So from the event to the experiential system making uh, automatic associative connections to other events or experiences within the same schema, that goes down to an emotional response or vibe 
which is elicited for the event as a whole. So that's kind of like how you feel about the whole thing going on. And then uh, this emotional response then directs the behavior that you uh, do. So that's kind of, uh, how do I want to put this? This, uh, this whole system of thinking gives me hope because if you can change the vibe that you receive from everyday things that would to normally piss you off and make it so that those things don't make you angry, but they make you happy, then that's how you'll behave as happy, you know? So it kind of gives me hope that, you know, people can change based on how they want to view the world. And if you want to view it positively or negatively, or, or you know, like if you want to go through a negative schema or a positive schema, then that's, uh, that's your choice, but you can make the choice. And one thing I, one uh, quote I really like that I've been using a lot is, you know, you can go down the wrong path, but there's no sign chain you can't turn around. So even if you're going down the wrong path, you can change your schema and then change your uh, the vibe you receive and change your behavior then. So there's it's saying that there's a possibility for change. You don't have to be stuck in the same system or same problems you've been going through. Uh, but does this uh, graph make sense? Is there any questions you have on it at the moment? I can't really read um the words on the graph but that's what you were you're talking you were just talking about what the graph is saying right? yeah yeah that makes sense okay uh so i'll go ahead and move on all right uh interaction the rational system often tries to understand or rationalize the behavior from the previous system uh the rationalization or the process of finding a rational explanation for experientially driven behavior occurs more than is generally recognized. So what they're saying here is I could be acting, like I could just do something really stupid and uh, my rational system will make it so that I believe that that was actually a smart thing for me to do. Even though what I did was stupid, I'll rationalize that away and either say that, well, maybe I was stupid here, but normally the system I use works or I'll fit, I'll change the view of that stupidity and make it into something that could be considered smart through rationalization. Mm. Uh, side note, uh, through the process of rationalization, we naturally select the most emotionally satisfying explanation for our behavior, so long as it does not seriously challenge our current belief system. Uh, the rational system is also capable of having an effect on the experiential system uh, because the system is slower, it can correct the automatic responses of the experiential system. So this allows us to consciously control our automatic responses and plays a major role in our capabilities of our mind, such as delayed gratification. Uh, repetition of conscious behavior can also cause the rational system to have an effect on the experiential system. When a conscious behavior is repeated often enough, it can become proceduralized and then becomes automatic. So that's kind of, uh, you know, how you can like, some people practice to get better and then other people practice so they can't mess up. Uh, I don't think I said that right, but I think you know what I'm talking about, where it's like, you wanna practice until you can, you don't wanna practice until you don't fail. You wanna practice until it's impossible to fail. Yeah, I think I've heard a quote like that. It's like, don't, don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. Yeah, that's exactly the quote I was looking for. Exactly. Yeah, like Michael Jordan. Oh, I don't Maybe. know who said it. But. I feel like it was a basketball. Definitely was a basketball quote. All right. Uh, so I don't have anything else for interaction, but. I'm gonna go ahead and get into why this matters or like, uh, uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read my notes on why it matters. And then this here, I guess I'll just explain it now. This is a uh, the cognitive experiential self theory information processing view of consumer behavior. So this is a real world example of how like a marketer would use this theory to kind of get at what you're gonna buy. 
So at the top, we have emotionally driven dispositions. And at the bottom, we have uh, logic driven dispositions. So the experiential systems at the top and the cognitive rational systems at the bottom. Uh, fuck. This is actually a pretty complex uh, drawing here. But pretty much what this is saying is you'll have an event and you can either take that event from two different ways of viewing it. Uh, your emotion system will want a need for variety and it would also take a fashion interest into consideration. So this is uh, based on like marketing. This isn't, this isn't uh, based on like blanket. This isn't a blanket statement. This only applies to marketing. So that's why fashion interests and ecological cons consciousness and social consciousness even applies here, because that's what you would logically want from your uh, your business that you're buying from. You want it to be ecologically conscious and social conscious. And then uh, for your emotions, you would want some variety and then you'd also want to look good. So you want it to be fashionable. Uh, so the experiential response would be either an effective response and that's pretty much it for them. And then for the rational system, you would have a cognitive response, but uh, you probably can't see it here, but the cognitive response can also affect your effective response or the experiential response, kind of we were getting into a little earlier in the video, where your uh, cognitive system can affect your experiential system. With then, cognitive, oh, oh yeah. Intuition and ration. Yeah. And then uh, obviously what the marketer is worried about is the outcome of either you purchase something or you're willing to pay more for something because it's, uh, it fits your logic driven dispositions. But that's a real world example of why this or how this could be used to, uh, I guess, make money since that's really all we care about in the real world. But uh, That's tough. <laughs> I have to go take a piss. Okay, no problem. Thank you for waiting. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay. So why a uh, reason why it matters and why SES or cognitive experiential self theory is important is that uh, SES presents the idea of an adaptive and adaptive unconscious. That is a major assumption of SES is that the experiential system was evolutionarily developed because it was adaptive by nature. And for the most part, it still remains adaptive and useful to us now. Uh, this is a major department, uh, a major departure from many past theories, which tend to focus on the maladaptive nature of the unconscious processing, which I guess I should have said that for why I decided to uh, insert this because uh, most theories in the past seem to think that our unconscious is really maladaptive and it's really bad for us to go through there because like for Freud, we, there was psychosexual and all that other stuff. So, you know, if you don't get to a certain stage, then you'll be stuck in a stage. So that's, uh, and then that's not rational. So that wouldn't be through a rational system. That would all be experiential. And that's, uh, that's why I felt I had to have this in here because uh, without this, I feel like this is just a really negative kind of presentation on the experiential system 
when it's actually a good thing for us. Like if we didn't have emotions, then we would be stuck like a rock because we would have no feeling or no need to want to move or we wouldn't feel fear and we wouldn't get scared of a line and they would come eat us or, you know, like our emotions are useful to us. Like obviously they can get out of control and become harmful, but for the most part, there's a reason why we have them. Uh, sure. Is, is that genetic necessarily though? Uh, the uh, is the experiential system genetic? Like, is it something you inherit from your parents? Yeah. And is it also something like, can you change it, or is it just like it is how it is? So it's definitely malleable. Uh, we kind of got into that in the last slide where okay uh, through repetition thing. and. Uh, like different forms of conditioning, you can make your uh, mm -hmm. make permanent changes in your experiential system. So I would say it's hereditary to a point, but then your rational system can also like if you're taught the right way of doing things instead of the wrong way, you can also uh, beat your conditioning. That makes sense. I got it off tra off track that you were talking about the same system. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh... So a number, there's also a number of important research applications associated with cognitive experiential self-theory. For example, human irrationality has consistently been a major area of focus in cognitive research. Sess argues that by getting an understanding of our rational and experiential systems, or getting a better understanding of our rational and experiential systems and how they interact, we can gain insight into how these primarily adaptive systems can in some case lead to maladaptive behavior. So what they're saying here is if we study this more and kind of get better with testing and get a better grip on like what these systems do like totally, then we'll have the, we can probably explain why people act uh, maladaptively. Uh, there's also clinical applications for SESS. Cognitive therapists commonly encourage individuals to appeal to their rational system to dispute maladaptive thoughts. Uh, and that's pretty much all I got for today. The, uh, I feel like this was at least a good, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna have to erase what I just said there, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what did you uh do you have any kind of well let me do this because it's what i normally do there we go all right uh do you have any kind of uh final or concluding thoughts for this uh theory like what did you think do you think it's uh it holds water or do you think it just has it's full of holes and not really all that useful i have probably i would say no con no contradictions with anything that you presented um i think the way that people think about them are differently like you could say um Like the, a lot of that seemed very uh, methodical, I guess, like breaking down and explaining, well, this is how and why things are. Um, but even in that description, talk about things like belief. And we didn't really say the word faith, but faith along those lines of um, believing in something to come in the future. There's both. There's a, two sides of it to look at and they're not contradictory they're just it's like well what do you want to focus on the um like the, the I, think, I guess like the material or spiritual kind of yeah. thing uh, and i think they line up with one another absolutely do i don't think they're separate it's just the description of them um because like you could say the way the last slide talking about like behavioral health i guess maybe um, saying like, well, you can you can change a person's thoughts. Like, well, it, you're right. If you if you're able to take a person and you're able to just change their thoughts, 
then they might start behaving a different way. But then the real human in that experience is saying like, well, but it's a hell of a lot harder to just change your thoughts than any medical book can make it sound, you know? Hell yeah. Oh yeah. And I think that I like this, it gives hope, but I feel like it can kind of be like a false hope in a way because it's like, oh, if you just change the way you think, then you'll change your uh, beliefs and then that'll change the way you experience life and other, but uh, you know, it's not that easy. You know, they say it takes about 30 days to uh, create a habit. So if you think of that, just imagine how many days you've been doing something constantly, like how many days you've gone through the same thought process constantly, constantly. It, the more you use it, True. the harder it's going to be to get rid of, you know what I mean? So True. I think that's definitely something worth noting that like you, you can change it, but the more ingrained it is, the harder it's going to be to remove. Very true. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I thought today was a pretty good episode. I thought we got in some, like, really, I don't want to say deep, but some really, uh, like, interesting stuff because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I'm right brain, I'm left brain, but, like, what does that really mean? And what are the ramifications of that? Because uh, like, as we saw earlier in the video, you know, if you're too experiential and you trust your faith too much, you know, you're liable to run into some problems. Uh, like you could be authoritarian and only believe that you're only right. So everyone else is wrong and mm-hmm. you don't got to believe nobody else's shit, even if you're wrong. And, mm-hmm. you know, getting stuck in something like that, you know, it's not somewhere you'd like to be. Or at least that's not somewhere mm-hmm. I would want to be. I hear that. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show today, Naaman. You had a lot of really great stuff, and I thought you really contributed to the conversation a lot. Uh, if you made it this far, you probably like this type of content. So I want to thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for new content every week that I can get it out. Uh, please enjoy your day, uh, and thank you.